Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You, I'm Dara O'Brien. Yes, only a week after the election and already an immigrant is doing this job. <laughs> you really should have listened to Howard, shouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> in the news this week, in Westminster, encouraged by their recent victory, anti-hunt protesters turned their attention to gay rights. <laughs> At a job centre in Essex, there's an early success for the Metropolitan Police's new Chav Prevention Squad. And in the Estonian Parliament, there's a mixed response to the European Union plans to introduce VAT on parsnips. <laughs> on in his team tonight is a writer and actor who once performed in a comedy act called The Oblivion Boys, a name which he has since kindly donated to the Conservative Party. <laughs> Please welcome Stephen Frost. And with Paul Merton tonight, a man who used to work on the buses before becoming an MP, coincidentally the exact opposite career path to Una King. <laughs> Please welcome Steve Pound. As ever, we start with round one. Ian and Stephen, this is for you. That's Blair, happy at his triumph. There's the winner. Even happier. <laughs> Hello. There's the dustbins. Come to get Blair. Min <laughs> sweep. Ah, oh, Ruth Kelly, the education structure. This is the reshuffle. Yeah. Guess who's back? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's the new cabinet arriving. It's <laughs> a box of vegetables. Yes, it's the new cabinet. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's a very exciting reshuffle. It really is, isn't it? Any particularly exciting parts of the reshuffle? Anything to strike you? Um, well, I think Blair wanted to appoint a number of people to the cabinet, and those people who already had the job said no. So that's it. Um, he's not really in power anymore. Everyone's just waiting for him to leave. The only thing he could do was appoint all the people who aren't elected to jobs, so he did that. So we had Lord Drayson. Yeah. He invented the vacuum cleaner, didn't he? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Sean Woodward. Yeah, he'd be a good one. He used to be, uh, used to be a Tory... Equaliser. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Has he still got the machine gun? That'll get things done. Certainly in Northern Ireland it'll yeah. help. <laughs> He married the Sainsbury's heiress he did, and then Sainsbury's. changed party. So he's just a Tory boy who the Labour have taken on board. The New lot. I, I, I'm the most loyal of, of backbenchers. So. That's not strictly true, is it? No, it's a complete <laughs> lie. <laughs> but having said that, see, bloody Andrew Adonis, a man who used to be in the SDP, a man with his half-baked daft ideas, who's even painted his front door red to try to infiltrate the People's Party, it's not on. Yes. No. So Can we got... cut that bit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> No, it's genuine passion. Uh, what was notable about Tony Blair's speech outside number 10? The day after the victory? It was just the length of the pauses, even more dramatic. <laughs> than... Anyway, let's have a look at it. Good morning, everyone. As you know, I've just come from Buckingham Palace, where the Queen has asked me to form a new government, which I will do. It's a tremendous honour and privilege to be elected for a third term. <laughs> we decided to tighten it up a bit and we took all the extraneous uh, stuff out and this is the message exactly as it should have been delivered on the day. So who has made a return to the fold? Who's made a swift return to the fold? Blunkett. Blunkett, of course! He's done five months of deep penance <laughs> in which he's said that um, he needed the time to get fit again to take up his new job. In he's charge of the CSA. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> in charge of the Child Support Agency, which should give us all a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's still in the house. He never left his grace and favour house. And um, he shows no signs of remorse at all. 
<laughs> well, tell you what, just for the crack then, uh, let's have, to mark the return of the phone for a section, a chance to win a checkbook and pen, let's have a quick game of Blunkety Blunk. <laughs> yes, microphone and everything. Uh, <laughs> I should never have had to resign, said shameless Lothario David Blunkett, because all I did was Blunk. How's it the way you start? Mislead a public inquiry? Get a rail ticket for the woman you're shagging on the grounds that <laughs> it's your spouse when anyone else would have been sacked if they'd been in the police or the army, which you're meant to be running as home. Sleep with somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> what did he do? I can't think. Yeah. It's called blankety blunk, not blankety 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 blankety
Oh, well, that was quite... We started on Prescott. That's, that's, that's in Moscow. To commemorate the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And uh, Blair didn't want to go, so he sent Prescott, and uh, everybody was so impressed that they stuck him full throw right at the back. And if we, we, can think... we can actually see just how far... If you imagine, like, you were fairly involved yeah. in the whole war yeah. thing, that's where Prescott got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> He's next door to Vira Vicky Freiberger. No, she's Adolf. He probably says, oh, Freiburger, fantastic, I'll sit there. Uh, <laughs> as Prescott always says, last into the photo, first into the buffet. <laughs> but if, if you look down the front, there's actually an empty space right next to Manmohan Singh. And the theory is that that empty space should have been occupied by the Prime Minister. Yeah. And it's a bit sarcastic that they've left it empty. They think it could have shoved somebody up. Really feeble excuse, though. Blair said he couldn't go because he was busy with his reshuffle. All the other major leaders turned up. Gosh, doesn't it make you feel proud? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what did Gerhard Schroeder bring to the party? A bottle of wine? <laughs> some marshmallows? No, he brought some Nazi veterans with him. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> not all dressed you. up as Prince Harry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What had Putin allowed Bush to do early in the day to show how much he trusted him? Hey, there, was, there was something about them dry. They were dry. Did they go shooting together? No, he drove his Volga. Uh, oh, yeah. The classic uh, Russian car from the 1950s. <laughs> but clearly not that much of it, then. <laughs> he is trying to drive him off the road, though, isn't he? <laughs> These are the VE Day celebrations which Tony Blair decided not to attend. The Russian organisers went to extreme lengths to ensure sunny weather. According to the Express, chemical missiles were fired into clouds to disperse rain over Red Square. And by sheer coincidence, landed in Chechnya. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Express, several Nazi veterans were invited to the ceremony, but unfortunately got bogged down in snow outside Moscow. <laughs> But the Stalingrad out of force of habit. For any young people, that was the joke, all right, yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's a load of different ways you could have done it, I accept that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For any young people watching, V Day celebrates Church's brilliant strategic uh, victory over Adolf Hitler. As you can see, he won because Hitler always chose paper. <laughs> Let's have the next spinning picture. That's the orange ship, the easy cruise ship. Uh, it's very, very cheap to get on, but people are sort of moaning about, sort of people who live in Cairns and stuff are saying, well, this awful ship comes to, into harbour. But uh, it's basically a uh, cut price cruise in by the same guy did EasyJet. Um, what's the first easy cruise ship called? Uh, I don't know, but I'm prepared to guess it's called the Oriana. No. <laughs> it was called the Oriana, I no, yeah, That kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's called Easy Cruise One. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really stretch himself, did he? Yeah. yeah. And here is the easy crew. <laughs> Man, how often will they hear that joke in the course of their working life? Yeah, that poor woman, there's another red coming out the back of her head. Look. <laughs> <laughs> she can never go more than 40 feet away from the boat no. at any stage. <laughs> get back here, get back here. <laughs> Is it one where you provide everything yourself, so you, you make your meals, you do the lectures about the places you're going you're to visit? Cruise, yeah. I don't think lectures are really a large part of the easy <laughs> cruise mentality. Are they not? The, it's not they all, not all about... John it's... Julius Norwich <laughs> <laughs> telling you about the glories of Venice. What sort of cruise is this? Oh, it's a very different kind of cruise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wayne Rooney's Guide to Slappers on Merseyside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before you, do you want to see a look at the, at the, at the decor, the interior of the boat? Yes, guess what colour it is. Uh, <laughs> could you sleep in that? Could you? Mm. And what happened on the boat's maiden voyage? Well, is it like the, the EasyJet flights where it says, you know, um, cheap flight to Paris and you go to Toulouse? Because <laughs> it's quite near and then you get a bus. <laughs> the, uh, the boat was battered by gales and stormy seas after leaving Cannes for Saint-Tropez. Due to the weather, it was forced to dock in the industrial town of Toulon. The Rough Guide to France calls it a squalid naval base. <laughs> I don't know, I've had some great nights in squalid naval bases. <laughs> <laughs> so how did some of the passengers finally get to Saint-Tropez? Did they walk? Nope. They were taken by bus. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the tourist industry in this country, how is life going to improve for donkeys? Oh, Blackpool donkeys, are, they're, they're working between 10 and 7, um, but they must have a compulsory one-hour lunch break. 
They must, you, you laugh, but donkeys, like yeah. us or any human, they need... <laughs> They need to have their break, and they sort of say they get inspected at the beginning of the summer season, and then they sort of like they're allowed to sort of like just you know read the Daily Mirror, put their feet up for an hour a day. That's theirs, and they get regular dental checkups. <laughs> we have an awful lot of people in this country pretending to be donkeys. <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> Free NHS checkup. I'm there. <laughs> uh, on the subject of loutish behaviour, which we. Was briefly alluded to uh, with the cruiser. Yeah, Did anyone see what's been yet. banned in Blue Water Shopping Centre? This hold on, hold on. we haven't got any points yet. <laughs> yeah, <'cause laughs> yeah, yeah, the old, uh, it's the um, baseball cap and the hoods. Yeah, it's the hoodies. Hoods have yeah. been banned. Yeah. yeah, I'm all for it though. I thought it was a terrific idea. Anyone wearing a hood? Nuns, for example, monks. Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely. Yes, yeah. all of them. <laughs> Those bloody Cistercians are always coming in here <laughs> nicking stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they've got hands inside yeah. that yeah. <laughs> Stick it all in the pockets. <laughs> You can get a microwave up those roads, yeah. yeah. like that. Right? <laughs> on skateboards as well, so they're just going. <laughs> This is the launch of Easy Cruise, a no-frills cruise liner aimed at fun-loving 18 to 30-year-old holidaymakers on a budget. The cost of sharing a cabin is a nasty rash. <laughs> <laughs> the new fleet will be painted in easy jet colours, so if you see a bright orange thing floating in the med, it's either one of their ships or Kilroy Silk on a lilo. <laughs> Time for our next spinning picture. <laughs> ah, hold it again. This is the, the dead cat. If your pet dies just as you go into an exam and you tell them that your pet's dead, here it is in a sack, then they'll give you 10% um, <laughs> extra marks. It's not 10%. 5%. No. Not 5%. 15. It's 2. It's 2%. Two percent. Paper! Paper! Paper. <laughs> <laughs> Two percent. Two percent if your pet dies, but, but only when does your pet have to die? On the morning of the exam. On the morning yeah. of the exam. What if you live in a zoo? <laughs> you can pass without writing anything down, couldn't well, you? Yeah, Rhino's yeah. gone. If well, you own a zoo. Pass a shotgun, I don't feel very confident. <laughs> 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 Well, you're sitting in practical biology, can you dissect it? <laughs> <laughs> For extra marks? Yeah. Yeah. Here's me coursework. Yeah. Quam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> There was a boy when I was doing O-level biology. You're making but... it up. Yeah. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You were given a specimen. It was, it was like a, an insect. In question one, it said, draw it. So he stabbed his compass <laughs> through it to make it still, and then he drew it. And question two was, observe its behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he's killed, he can just trace around it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cheating. How can you prove oh. that you're, you know, you say, well, my dog died yesterday, what do, you know, they, they just accept that? You just say that? And that's accepted as proof? I presume there's a forensic scientist of some description who has to go and draw a chalk <laughs> around the dog. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> and measure the temperature of the dog and go, yeah. Yeah. like, yeah. CSI, GCSE. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's dig him up and see if he accepts a biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got asthma, um, you get an extra two points. No, well, no, not if you have asthma. If you have an asthma attack, you get two points. Listen, if you what got if asthma... What if you're attacked by an asthmatic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he also kills your dog in a mild frenzy. <laughs> uh, yes, an asthma attack, or indeed being attacked by an asthmatic, uh, <laughs> you'd hear them breathing. Oh. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> witnessing a distressing event that day, if you saw somebody being attacked by an asthmatic... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you sort of say, look, I'm totally distressed because I don't know anything? <laughs> <laughs> and this is causing me trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've just spotted the fundamental flaw. What, look that, at that young people may lie? Uh, no! <laughs> There's just such a great world of misery out there that all these things can actually influence you, and I think we have to take it into consideration. Is this your message to the electorate? There's a great world of misery <laughs> out there. <laughs> <laughs> Vote Labour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, these are the new exam board guidelines which award pupils higher marks if they suffer a distressing event on the day of the exam, such as a pet dying. If your pet rabbit dies, it's doubly good news. You get higher marks and for extra luck, you can bring in its foot. <laughs> No, it's, it's true. Oh, Matt, they get so much worse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> According to the Guardian, you can get 5% for a family bereavement and 4% for a serious car accident. So that's how Prince Harry scraped to his A-levels. <laughs> <laughs> no, to be fair, you were, you were warned. You were warned. <laughs> you were warned. <laughs> round three is the odd one out round. Just one between you this week. John Lennon, Margaret Thatcher, Oscar Wilde and David Blunkett. 
<laughs> Margaret Thatcher's the odd one out because all the others have written poetry. John Lennon wrote a book called uh, A Spaniard in the Works. Oscar Wilde, of course, was a poet, Ballad of Red and Joe, etc. Day for Fundus. Uh, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> David Brunkett has recently written some poetry, which is, is bears some resemblance to some poetry by W.H. Auden. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, she's never written poetry, but she quoted poetry when she became the Prime Minister in 1979. So it's, she's the odd one out. It's not the correct oh, answer. Okay. Oh, OK. No. Cats would be a good thing. Andrew Lloyd Webber is going to write a musical about all four of them, apart from one. <laughs> Maggie, Maggie, Moggy. He's going to write music for Moggy. No, it is cats as a, rather than the animals themselves. It is a musical. It is right? a musical. So, oh, oh yes, John Lennon. Just a, just a new musical about John Lennon in America. Yoko Ono's uh, Oscar Wilde. Yes, Oscar Wilde. Mike Reed did a musical, didn't he? Yeah. Oscar Wilde that closed remarkably after oh, one yeah. performance. Oh yeah, Blunkett the musical. Yeah. That actually has been on. Yeah. And right. so Thatcher's the odd one out because there's not been a musical about her. I'll give it that. It's the answers. They've all had musicals based on their lives, apart from Margaret Thatcher, who's a subject of a controversial song in Billy Elliot, the Billy musical. Elliot, yeah. So well done, we get the points ah, for that. Okay. David Blunkett, the musical, traces the former Home Secretary's political journey from his humble beginnings in the North to the capital's corridors of power and his dramatic downfall. This is an extract from a David Blunkett, the musical. On the left, David Blunkett. On the right, Kimberly Quinn. And the beginning of a love story. To sleep with a blind man. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed. That's what she said. He laughed, but that's what she said to him <laughs> when she first met him. That but it sounds better delivered by a soprano, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'll have to go. <laughs> Uh, John Lennon uh, had his world premiere in San Francisco in April this year. Oscar Wilde was written, as you said, by DJ Mike Reed. Mm -hmm. What record did it break? Well, the musical virtually closed at the interval. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure, this theatrical run has probably ever been. Yeah, Is it one day? It was one, one night that they had. Yeah. They had opening and closing night parties on the same evening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Any excuse? And they only sold five of the 466 tickets for the second night. <laughs> uh, who did Reed blame for the poor sales? The critics. No, actually. I, yeah. Reviews hadn't even come out of that stage. Oh, right, of course not. It they. was the theatre's inadequate box office facilities. Because oh. those five phone calls are tough to juggle sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, Margaret Thatcher was the odd one out. In Billy Elliot, the musical, The Striking Miners, I sing a song, Merry Christmas, Maggie Thatcher, we celebrate today because it's one day closer to your death. <laughs> <laughs> the music goes by Elton John, original lyrics by Ted Heath. <laughs> <laughs> How did Elton particularly love the film? Uh, he identified with the youth because he himself was musical at an early age? Yeah, essentially he saw a little bit of himself in Billy. Did he? <laughs> And so to our Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication the quarterly bulletin of the National Vegetable Society. <laughs> its latest issue includes a letter from a Mr Purdy who asks, how often has one grown or been given as a present a cabbage which is too big for a family <laughs> meal? <laughs> oh, don't get me started, Mr Purdy. <laughs> so here are the headlines, but what are the missing words? Here goes with... What means the end of Fat Pang's tarts? <laughs> 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 Fat Pang's wife finding out. Look at the boys, fat. They got our pussy chest. Look at our pussy. It's actually rent rise. A huge rent increase has forced the closure of the Tai Chung Bakery in Hong Kong, a popular haunt of former Governor Lord Patton, Chris known Patton. to Logan as Fat Pank. Lord Patton revealed that his favourite in the bakery was egg custard tart, but he also said he's very fond of pecan pie, the shop's owner. <laughs> Next, Martin what early this year? Peaked. Peaked. <laughs> yeah, <good point. laughs> Cheated, I would think. <laughs> Cheated. Mm. That's a serious allegation. <laughs> Very serious allegation. There's a whole world of misery out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is about vegetables, isn't it? Um, it's actual pride is the word. Martin pride early this year. Is there a big march in Lambeth? <laughs> <laughs> People go along in flowery T-shirts <laughs> saying, yeah, I'm a bit like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time I had a bloody parade. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't demand a parade, it looks bad. A parade just, <laughs> just happens spontaneously. You should look humbly surprised, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you can't you start done. organising it. Well, uh, yeah. Open your door and there's 100 people going, we're here, we're Paul, get <laughs> used to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have. Yeah, exactly. 
The Merton Pride is, of course... I mean, what I want is, like, little school kids with papi and mache heads that look like me. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you speak to the producers on this programme and think I'm asking for the world. <laughs> I told them there's a world of misery out there, let's grind it out. What sort of vegetable is a Merton Pride, anyway? It's a pear. All my fruit has been early this year, writes the editor of the Quarterly Bulletin of the National Vegetable Society. Well, it's not really your thing, is it? So. <laughs> Next. Rubber gloves save what? A oh, woman 64 struck by lightning. I know about this because every time I see anything in the newspaper about marigold gloves, I read it. Why? I'm just saying it's happened to be an interest of mine. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. The way they test the quality of the room service in hotels is that they say, send me up a clothes peg, a pair of marigold gloves and a spare pillow. And that is the test. And clothes I'd peg, what, what, what? a pair of marigold gloves <laughs> and, and spare a pillow. pillow. Sounds yeah. like a good night out to me. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since that... <laughs> I've always wondered. I thought what that the was hell. how you were meant to vote Labour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then smother yourself. <laughs> but if they always ask for the same thing, when another hotel knows what they want, they said, "Okay, you phone them and say, I want a tuba, a rhinoceros." <laughs> A tuba playing rhinoceros. No, no, a rhinoceros <laughs> playing a tuba. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a tuba playing a rhinoceros. <laughs> 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 That's That's a really impossible. Uh, yes, it is originally, if you remember Lindem back that far. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the story of a woman struck by lightning while doing the washing up. Mrs Edwards told the Express, I never dreamed that one day my marigold rubber gloves would <laughs> save my life. Some people have no imagination. <laughs> According to the Express, her son Rod was nearby. <laughs> it was in like lightning, wasn't it? <laughs> but didn't attract the lightning, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> the final scores, ladies and gentlemen, um, oh, have been relatively one sided. Uh, Ian and Stephen have three points, but romping home with 12. It's Paul and Steve. <laughs> On which note we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hisop and Stephen Frost, Paul Merton and Steve Pound. And I'll leave you with news that, in the woods, a bear is told to wait his turn... <laughs> <laughs> BBC chiefs denied that the programme budget has been drastically cut for the next series of Doctor Who. <laughs> and a Barnsley man begins to wonder when his wife will get back from Ikea with the missing bracket. Good night. <laughs>